Genesis 16, I'm going to read the first six verses. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please, go into my maid, perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarah dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So ten years have passed. And throughout this time, you can just imagine Sarah being frustrated, verging on hope about why she's still barren. And she has suffered this, as we can tell in Scripture, in silence. But now her impatience has reached a critical point. And we have to remember back in chapter 15, the divine promise that was given did not specify that she herself was to be the mother of Abram's offspring. And so in her desperation, she takes the initiative to fulfill it. Now let me go back on that for a minute. Sarah, this happens to all of us, okay? Abraham has this theophany experience with God. And God tells him, your seed that is going to come through you will bless the world. And Sarah knew that was her going to be her. Why wouldn't she think that? They're married. Okay? So ten years have passed. And she's starting to get desperate. She's starting to think, this isn't going to happen. Maybe I heard it wrong for us today. Maybe I read it wrong in the Bible. Since things aren't going the way I envision they should be going, maybe I've interpreted it wrong. And this is what we do. We start, we, we, we start panicking in our mind and saying, well, I saw this person over here that's professed to be a Christian, then 10 years later, they've been coming to church and all that regularly, then 10 years later, they, 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 they reject Christ. We never see him in church. Maybe I've read these verses wrong that say you can lose your salvation. This is what we do. We start going over our mind and we start twisting scripture around. This is what Sarah's doing. She, Sarah realized she was barren, obviously, and now she's past the age of childbearing. So in her mind, she's going to remedy this situation in order that Abraham might obtain the promised blessing. And Sarah was a very godly woman. You know, we read about her in 1 Peter 3, 6. In 1 Peter 3, 6, it says, So Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter you are if you do good or are not afraid with any terror. So we have to, Sarah was a very godly woman, but she's stumbling now here, just like we all do. We all do. And, and her barrenness, not being able to bear children in that culture, in that time, it was, a, it was really a bad mark on her. People would talk. Why is she bearing children? The more children you could bear in that ancient culture, the more successful you were deemed. Remember uh, John the Baptist's parents, Zachariah, and I can't remember her name, uh, uh, Elizabeth? Yes. They, uh, uh, they didn't have any children, and they were well up in their age. And you know people were talking about them. What kind of sin did they commit that she's not able to bear children? So Sarah, it, 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 there's a lot of pressure on her in culture. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. It says, Now Sarah, 
Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children, she's right. Please go into my maid, perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heaped it, uh, where is it? And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. So now Sarah's beginning to scheme here. She's she makes this fatal choice of Hagar, giving Hagar as a concubine to Abraham. She, what she's doing is she's discounting the power of God. Her hope has been drained in these 10 years, and she's going to take matters in her own hand. <coughs> See, she has two choices here. Either she can remain barren, even if that means the rest of her life, or until God changes her circumstances. That's choice one. Either be content in the circumstance that she's in and rely on God's wisdom, or she's going to uh, she's going to start complying with culture's remedy of using a concubine. She's going to reach. She's going to try and justify her actions with cult, with the culture. So. She starts, she, she resorts to a contemporary custom of that day, which was widely accepted in the ancient Near East, to resolve her dilemma. And that is polygamy. That is, she's going to give her, her uh, maid, Hagar, to Abraham to maybe have children through Hagar. You know, what do we do today? What do we, we, culture says it's okay to live together before marriage, right? And then, you know, you know, since the Bible makes it clear that sexual expression should only be within a marriage covenant between man and woman, but what does our culture say? It's just the same as this culture with polygamy. Okay, in, in in Scripture, you have what you call descriptive and prescriptive. When you're reading a verse, you might see a, a verse that talks about polygamy or something to that extent. That's just a description of reality, what was happening. God's not saying it's okay or not. He's just giving the reality of the situation in that culture. Then when you read certain, uh, certain parts of Scripture, it's what you call prescriptive. It's like a command or something. God's telling you what, he, uh, what is sin and what isn't. And so when you read verses like polygamy, it, it's... It's descriptive. It's just telling the reality of that situation. God's not saying it's okay or not. Because Genesis chapter 2, 24, actually, it's when God made, he said, God made man and female, female and male, and joined them together in a covenant of marriage. And when the Pharisees, back in, when you go to Matthew chapter 19 especially, the Pharisees came to Jesus and asked him about divorce. And what did Jesus do? He went back to the to the beginning in Genesis and said marriage is between a man and a female, right? And so that's what we always have to remember. It was never said it was okay to be a polygamous situation. God never said it was okay. And I'm going to get into polygamy in several weeks down the road when we get to a certain part of Scripture. I'll explain the whole polygamy situation. But today... What we can substitute that with is today the culture says it's okay to live together before you're married. Matter of fact, you're odd if you don't in this culture. It's the same thing. And you know, a test can be, uh, have I really heard God? How many times have we said that in, in, to ourselves? Have I really heard God or how can I hear God or how do I know God is speaking to me? One way you know is if you have people in the culture saying marriage is more than just male and female, and then to profess to be a Christian, you're, you, I guarantee you, you're not hearing God. Correct? Hey, whatever, when you want to know if God is speaking to you, it's going to line up in the Word of God. And so we have a lot of people today saying they're Christians, and that they heard the voice of God, but what they're hearing is contradicting what the Bible says. That's one test whether you're hearing the word of God or not. But look at Sarah. She has a mixture of good and bad in her heart. I hate using those words, good and bad. Sarah, see, she, she so wanted God's promise to Abraham to be fulfilled that she was willing to sacrifice 
for special intimacy with her husband, with another woman, in order for Abraham. She thought for sure that this is how God's going to fulfill this promise. Was she hearing the word of God? No. You know, at the same time, there's a little blame and anger in her response. See, what she's going to do, she's going to take care of what God hasn't done yet. She's going to remedy the situation. And there's an ironic twist also here. Remember in Egypt, when faithless Abraham had given Sarah to the Egyptian pharaoh? Remember that back there? And now in Canaan here, uh, Sarah gave Abraham her Egyptian servant. And, and you, what that kind of reminds me of is, this, this is personal. For each person, it's personal. But when you commit a sin, you know, God has a way of bringing that sin back up in some situation that will remind you of that sin. And that's all personal with people, but God loves you so much that he will work in your circumstances to bring up sin. But we'll get to that more. Look at verse 3. It says, Then Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her mate, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. You see, this is another illustration of a believer with their back against the wall. They feel pressured to take the initiative in order to bring about God's promise. That's what Sarah is doing. And that's what our temptation is at times. Is we know what God has said. We know what he says in his word. We know what he said to our heart over a situation. But we don't wait long enough. God's, whenever you have to wait on God, one of God's promises, he, he's cultivating uh, perseverance in you. And, and he's showing you uh, your, of, of your impatience. So we have to wait on the Lord. But that's what Sarah is doing. She's taking the situation in her own hands to fulfill how she perceives God should be doing this. In verse 4 and 5 it says, So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon me. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. If we're scandalized, let me put it this way, by Sarah volunteering Hagar as to her husband to have a child through, Abram, Abraham, passive, compliant conduct is even more offensive. Okay? He, not Sarah, heard the voice of God. Remember audibly. Remember the theophany. He's the one that led them to earth, his family to earth. He's the one that had no divine directive from God to go into Hagar. Abraham was also fresh from this theophany. So he had more responsibility here. Sarah's actions, if you want to get technical, remind us of Eve. Here, Abraham listened to his wife just as Adam listened to his. I'm not saying it in bad. I'm saying it in, you know, I'll flick this out in a minute here. Abraham was also, uh, here Sarah took Hagar just as Eve took the fruit. Okay? Here Sarah gave Hagar to her husband just as Eve gave the fruit to Adam. And in both cases, the man, Adam and Abraham, willingly and knowingly partook. And the, 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 the thing is, the more knowledge you have, the more responsibility you have to God. They're, they're both to blame, don't get me wrong. But Abraham's a lot more to blame than, than Sarah. Abraham had more encounters with the Lord. He's the one leading his family. And yet he gives in, just like Adam had direct revelation from God, yet he's the one that gave in to Eve. He should have been leading Eve, and Abraham should have been leading Sarah. So Abraham's more at fault here. And remember during the covenant process, the descendants of Abraham were to be enslaved and oppressed in Egypt. Remember God said that to Abraham? By taking the Egyptian maidservant, all kinds of problems are going to happen here, he has become enslaved. 
And you see, it goes back to whether she, he heard God or not clearly. And whenever we go into disobedience, when you become born again, God has broken that bond of slave. You're not a slave to sin anymore when you become born again. When he changes your nature, you become in love with, your, with, with Jesus. You become, you, you have a, uh, your desires are changed, your motives are changed, you want to please God, you have fear of God in a healthy way, you love the Lord. But sometimes when we stumble and fall into sin, and we try and justify it by saying, well, the culture's changed, the word of God and, you know, needs to change right along with the culture, you're not hearing God. And what ends up happening is you become enslaved back to sin, if you want to go that far. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they waver by following the culture's regular custom. And that's what we do today. We allow the culture to, in, to change the church instead of the church changing the culture. In verses 7 through 16, it says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they, sh they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, you shall bear a son, you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then he called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Bir Larah. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Barah. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So going back to verse 7, when it says, uh, Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Hagar flees towards her native homeland. But before she's able to reach it, she has a divine encounter with the pre-incarnated Christ. And I, before I finish here, I'll get into the, who the angel of the Lord is. But this is, a, this is Christ at times in the Old Testament appeared as a human being. And this is one of those instances. In verse 8, it says, And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Before Hagar even speaks, the angel knows her name, her position, and the identity, identity of, her, of his mistress. So the whole episode is a divine encounter is under the sovereign control of God. It's kind of what we said today, Ken did in, in the Sunday school. Did God know Zachariah? How did God know Zachariah's name? Well, Zacchaeus. Oh, Zacchaeus. How did he, how did he know Zacchaeus' name? Well, it's because he was he he knew as God who he was searching for. And it's the same thing here. The angel, I'll say, the angel comes to Hagar, and knows everything about Hagar. And then down in verse 9 it says, The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. So this runaway Hagar may be compared with, maybe if you ever read Philemon in the New Testament, one chapter, uh, there was a Christian slave there who Paul was uh, prepared to send back to his owner Philemon. It's the same type of thing going on here. Hagar becomes a lady of faith here. And obedience, she offers no resistance or rebuttal to this angel's command to go back to your mistress. 
She can only obey and trust God for the situation she's going back to. She has no idea what she's going back to. The last thing she remembers is that Sarah and probably Abraham treated her pretty bad. But now this divine men, well, she knew it was God's telling her, go back and submit yourself to your mistress. And so she acts in obedience, because in verse 10 it says, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that you shall not be counted for multitude. The divine command that, that God is giving her is followed by the divine promise. Obedience to God is a result of true saving faith. Because we're going to see in a minute, this is, there's no reason not to doubt that Hagar has become born again. That Hagar uh, believes in the God of Abraham. And she is, the first thing you do when you become born again, what's the first thing you do? You desire, because your desires are changed, your motives are changed, your nature is changed. You desire willingly to obey God whatever he tells you to do. You want to obey him. And this is what's happening with Hagar. In verse 11 when it says, and the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. Remember when Hagar plotted her pregnancy before Sarah? That was the cause of her downfall. You know, I've heard it said before, only a woman knows how that look went. I'm going to go back to... Uh, Verse 5, and Sarah said to Abram, oh, wait a minute, verse 4. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. She had a way of looking at Sarah. That Sarah, that it is just only a woman can do or another woman. But see now, so Hagar flees because of this. But now the word of the Lord. So now that the word of the Lord comes to Hagar, she doesn't try and justify herself at all. The word of the Lord came to Hagar in the wilderness just like he did to Moses, just like he did to Elijah, just like he did to John the Baptist. In verse 12, when it says, She shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. The historical reality of this situation is that the offspring, Ishmael's offspring, becomes a thorn to God's people, both under the Old and New Covenants. That's why there's no peace in the Middle East. It's between the Arabs and the Israelites. Little did Abraham and Sarah imagine that their shortcut that they took to fulfill God's promise would originate in a conflict that will, is going to last until Christ returns. In verse 13 and 14, when it says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Bir Larah. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Barad. So Hagar's attitude has changed since the beginning of this chapter when she just. When she, how she looked at Sarah after she could see. And now she, look what she focuses on, what Hagar focuses on. She focuses on, on the God who manifested himself to a pregnant woman in the wilderness rather than on any, any other special status that's accorded to her. She is, uh, she is consumed with the Lord right now. She didn't take pride in the information about the child she would bear, but rather she took pride in God who appeared, appeared to her. She willingly goes back and submits to Sarah out of obedience to the Lord who saved her. Her whole, her whole mind is consumed with the Lord. And she goes willingly back not knowing what's in store for her with Sarah and Abraham. In 15 and 16 it says, So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. It seems, when you read scripture here, that Sarah's intervention is going to take matters in her own hands and Abraham's willingness 
to obey probably delayed the problems for some 13 years. And that's what it appears. Shortcuts definitely go compromise, never promote God's promise. See, what a mess life had become for them. What a mess our lives are. Everybody's life is a mess in the entire history of mankind. If you try and say your life is not a mess, then either you're, you're walking with your head in the clouds and denying it, or you're acknowledging something is wrong here. And when, when look at the two women. They never get along. This is the result of polygamy. And there is nothing Abraham could do about it. And, and the conflict escalated when Isaac is going to be born down the road. And you know how tragic it is for us as believers to take shortcuts and compromises because we're not waiting on the war. There is grace and forgiveness for all who turn to Christ. Okay, but listen to what I'm about to say here. Very often, many times, the Lord will restore the years the locusts have eaten up. He will. He's that good of a God. But some sins cannot be undone in this world. The result of your sin. And we need to, we need to learn that we need to live by grace and be content with our lot in life. Now that, that is, doesn't mean that maybe Brenda or Mary Jo had this horrible sin and God's not able to restore those years. Or God's not able to completely mend that sin. That's not what I'm saying. Because God does it with a lot of people. But in His wisdom, this is what we have to believe in. It's God's wisdom to allow Athena or Eda to have a certain sin that they commit to, they, they're going to struggle with the rest of their life, the result of that sin. Not because God can't undo it, but because God knows it's best for somebody in that situation to live the results of that sin. And that's where we have to trust in God's wisdom. It, just because somebody gets a divorce and the whole family goes to... Uh, uh, it gets destroyed, whatever you want to say, doesn't mean that they're a worse sinner than somebody else that went through a divorce and God has healed that family. That's not what, what's going on here. There's no sin God can't heal and restore what the years the locusts have eaten. No, no sin is greater than the God I worship. So don't ever judge another person because maybe God has left that person with the consequences of their sin for his glory and for that person's good. And really fast on the, on the there's several passages, especially here in Genesis, where they speak of the angel of the Lord in a way that is suggesting that it is God himself taken on human form in order to appear briefly to various people in the Old Testament. In Genesis alone, we have it right here in Genesis 16, we have it in chapter 18, chapter 22, chapter 24, 32, and 48. It's all over the place. And, and what it is, is it's, it's not saying a angel, it's saying the angel of the Lord. That's the first thing you have, we have to realize. And so the angel of the Lord finds Hagar in the wilderness, and he promises her a multitude of descendants. In which, look at Hagar's response. She calls him a God who sees. Okay? The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and said in Genesis 22, Now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son from who? From me. This is what the angel is saying. You have not withheld your son from me. Then the angel of the Lord, this is one of my favorites, and we'll get to it, Genesis 31, when, when the angel uh, of God appeared to Jacob in a dream, and he says, I am the God of Bethel, where you made a vow to me. See, the angel is, is, is uh, I truly believe the supreme incarnated Christ that they're, that they're uh, uh, encountering. Remember the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus 3. And he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I just watched, well, almost done with the Ten Commandments last night. Remember when Moses at the bush? It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses within the bush. 
And the angel of the Lord said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what's the next thing he says? Take your sandals off your feet to the place where you're standing. is holy ground because my presence is here. And so many times throughout the Old Testament, I think it's, it's God's way of preparing us for when Jesus Christ took on humanity forever and became the God man. 100% God, 100% man, and those natures never mix. The unique, one of a kind, son of God. And you know what? When you think about this, because this blows me away every time I try and think about this. Jesus would never stop being a human being. For eternity, he's going to be the God man. 100% God and 100% man in those natures never mix for eternity. So we're going to see Jesus Christ and how much he's done for you. 